Creatives on the Couch. I'm Gemma Cosgrove, joined by Zach Rose. Today, we have the absolute delight to speak to Gillian Cosgrove, an award-winning comedian, musician, writer and composer. Gillian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, we're going to take you right back. Great. Let's tell, go. Us, tell us, how have you got involved in the arts and into this creative world that you live in and work in? Sure. Um, I'm the second oldest of five children, and I was always the oldest at home, and I was very bossy. So from a very <laughs> early age, well, you know, we only say bossy about girls. I would say yes, I was you... assertive, and I had a vision. A born um, leader. Yeah, sure, exactly. Um, <laughs> just don't ask my siblings. Um, so I just kind of always loved... Um, performing, creating, making things. So I would harass my poor siblings into being in plays and horrible musicals and force all our extended relatives to watch them anytime anyone made the mistake of coming into the house. Um, and so I kinda, it's kind of always what I wanted to do in, in some capacity. Um, and I, for a long time I thought that was going to be specifically musical theatre. So when I finished high school, that was kind of the direction that I wanted to go in. And I went to uh, WAPA, the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts, to study musical theatre. And while I was there, I started to get a little bit into cabaret because it's this kind of like beautiful amorphous thing. Um, it, nobody really knows what it is. You can kind of do whatever you want. And I'd always played the piano and I always written my own songs. And so after I graduated, I started doing that kind of stuff. I started doing solo cabaret shows. Um, which sort of evolved into eventually becoming more comedy, stand-up comedy and original songs. And then everything else is just kind of... I, I always wanted to have a career that was multifaceted, where I could work across like a range of roles in the industry. Um, and I'm very lucky that that's what I do now. That's what I kind of get to do. And yeah, that's a very short version. <laughs> that's really <laughs> you know? exciting. Yeah. Uh, would you have a favourite musical? from uh, all that studying of musical theatre that you had? Oh, sure. I mean, I always... The dream is cabaret for me, that the musical cabaret. Yeah. Um, I just think it's the most... I think it's a brilliant show. I think it's just fascinating and kind of the way it... Um, it does with politics, but also the way that it uses performance. But then there are so many, you know, there are so many incredible... And so many different musicals. There are as many different musicals as there are um, writers and audience members, you know? So... Um, Obviously, I'm a big old Sondheim fan. Yes. Um, she loves a Sunday in the Park with George. We love a Sweeney Todd. Um, a murdering musical is always a joy. So, Absolutely. yeah, kind of a whole, a whole range of different stuff. Yeah. Really? And you said even from a young age or when you were studying, you've been writing your own music. And where, where do those ideas come from? How have you brought that about? I mean, writing music is a gift. It's not something that people are always born with. Have you trained with some of the formal techniques around the theory of writing music or do you find that it just comes to you? How does that come about? Um, I have not trained formally in writing music, <laughs> very much not. Um, but I did, you know, like when I was, I started playing the piano when I was about five and I did all my like classical piano exams. So I did all the like theory. So I have a working knowledge. I read music. Um, I can write music, but I'm very lazy. <laughs> very rarely don't take things. Um, I'm having to do more of that now, which is a good skill to gain. But um, I suppose when I when I first started writing shows, I would I had the idea that there would be like covers in the show that I would do other people's songs as well as my own, and I would sit down and I would go, okay, I'll put that song in here. And I was trying to sort of mold the show around that song, but actually I was like, no, I know what I want the show to be, and this song doesn't specifically say or do what I want in this moment, so I'll just write something that fits that brief. So I like it. It's, uh, it's sort of like doing a puzzle. I have a very puzzly brain, so I love a crossword. I love a cryptic. And there's something really nice about going, okay, well, the idea is this. The joke is this. The joke should be at the end of the line. What's a way I can back engineer this rhyme to kind of fit in there? And, I, and so I was always kind of doing it on my own, um, as a lot of writers do, is what writing is. And then it's been nice in the last few years to do more collaboration and to work with other um, incredible creatives and to see that, like, oh, no, we're actually all doing it like this. You know, like, I had the good fortune a few years ago to write an opera with Casey Bonetto uh, and a composer named Julian Langdon. And Casey wrote Keating the Musical and is just an absolute genius. And he and I wrote the lyrics together. And we had a very slow process of sort of, like, initially writing separately and then coming together and being like, I'll show you mine. <laughs> and uh, what was so nice about that is as we started to collaborate, 
is realizing that, you know, this is a person who is many years ahead of me, who has a lot more experience. But I was like, oh, you're, that's how I'm doing it. You're doing it like I'm doing it. So that was really, it was really nice to go, even though you're figuring this out on your own, there are some things that are sort of universal that you just, you, they're the tools that you have to kind of pick up to do this work. And so, yeah, it's really nice. And it's also nice to see the tools that other people have that you've never thought of using. That's a, that's a really cool thing too. It's kind of like your Oscar Hammerstein and their Richard Rogers. Yeah, yeah, but also Lorenz Hart, right? You've got to yes. collaborate with a lot of different people. It's good for you. I feel like you've given yourself a really nice chance to write fewer lyrics with an opera. Am I right? There's <laughs> fewer words. We, we did not, of... no. <laughs> Smarter, lazier people would have done that. Lazier, more efficient. Um, no, I would say Casey and I wrote... Just as, just as many words as you would ever write in a musical as in an opera, except you have to sing all of them, so you've got to make sure all of it works in that context. Yeah, a joke, not a dig. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm offended, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> now, your first, uh, your first debut cabaret, um, waitressing and other things I do well. What are these other things you do well? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about them now. <laughs> 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 Oh God, that's a very long time ago. Um, I was that, that was a show about, you know, your, your classic like straight out of drama school show where you're like, I'm a waitress, but I want to be an actress, it's hard. Um, <laughs> and relate. thankfully people forgave me my naivety because there were enough jokes in it, I think. Um, God, I can't even remember what was in that show. There was a whole song that was like sexual innuendo about Ikea furniture. Um, <laughs> What else was in there? I used to do a lot of... There was a time where I was doing a lot of waitressing um, to pay the bills and a lot of teaching. So I think there was like a whole... It was like a section where I would give a piano lesson to an audience member. Look, we all have to learn somewhere and I learned a lot of things. Absolutely. <laughs> well, tell us more about what you learn from every show you do and every project that you work on. Do you use your experience to inform the next or do you try to park it or do you try to bring it back like every good comedian does? Do you bring it back into the next show? Um, yeah, everything's grist for the mill, you know. It's nice to, I think, I've, the last kind of couple of years I've felt at a point in my career where it's a real benefit to have all these different hats, to be, as well as a performer, a, um, a writer, a composer, a, a director sometimes as well, and to be able to, to be in a project and to kind of be looking at it, not passively, but um, with curiosity. So that even if you're working on something that's not necessarily your bag or, or, or that's very different to the way that I might do it, is to kind of sit there and look at it and go, okay, well, why don't I like this? <laughs> why, why do I think this is not the right way to do this? Or how, how might I do this? Or who would I use to do that thing instead? So I think you learn something from every single show um, that, you're a, that you're a part of or every um, creative endeavour. And that's, that's a really helpful mindset for me, I think, to go... There's always something to be gleaned from every single one of those experiences in what, whatever way that it is. And that's why I also really like working across so many disciplines. You know, it's been very um, uh, eye-opening and, and very pleasant to come back to working just by myself and doing a solo show and doing back to comedy and touring and producing. But I was also like, oh, that's right. Sometimes this is really lonely. Like, sometimes you do like a brilliant show and you're like, yeah, and then you just go home on the tram alone. And that's, <laughs> and it's not sad. It's just what the job is. Yeah. Um, but I had spent, you know, three and a half years before that in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child where I work with a hundred other people every day and that is brilliant and can be very energising but can also be very draining day to day. So it depends what, you know, every job has its kind of, its perks and its downfalls and it's just about kind of going, well, what's good about this and what can I use for the next thing and that's the vibe. Tell us about your experience with Harry Potter and the Cursed Child because uh, in your last comedy show too, we heard a little bit of insights around your experience uh, but also it, it's an, an incredible show and an international show, award-winning, lots of public attention. What was your role, first of all, or roles, and how did you find that experience? Sure. I, so I was in the, very, in the show from the very beginning. Um, I auditioned at the end of 2017, which is wild. that We started rehearsals in October 2018, um, and I came out of it in March 2022, which is like kind of wild you know it's a very long chapter of my life and um I played Moaning Myrtle in the original cast and then after the first year I took over the role of um Delphi Diggory who's a character that exists just for the play who's not in the books 
and it was unbelievable. I've never, it's, um, it's the first experience I've had of being in a commercial theatre production where you're working at that massive scale with, you know, hundreds of people and a very big cast and it's fancy. Like you're rehearsing with like the full set in the room, you're rehearsing with a revolve and all the, you know, like props and everything from the beginning. Um, you have a rehearsal cloak, you have like rehearsal shoes, just all these kind of fancy things that you don't, you know, have outside of that sector. Um, and it was an incredible experience. It was tr incredibly hard work. It was a physically very demanding show. Um, and I think any kind of long run show where you're doing eight shows a week um, is a very demanding schedule. You're doing rehearsals in the daytime as well through all of that to get all the kind of understudies ready so that people can be shifting and changing at a moment's notice. And it's, it becomes like a, a microcosm. It's its kind of own environment. You know, you go into that building and you're suddenly, it's like having, you know, 99 housemates pretty much and you just have to sort of get along and work out how to make this thing happen together. I think one of the nicest things I took away from it is that the scale of that show, especially in the original two-part production where it was two, two-and-a-half-hour shows, meant that every single person in every department uh, across the entire production was doing the, the hardest, largest possible version of their job they'd ever done. So it really opened a door for like an incredible amount of empathy to be like, yes, I'm here and I'm the actor and I run around pretending to be a child wizard for money, <laughs> but also you are doing like a, a hundred different wigs and you were doing all these changes and you are maintaining all of these costumes and you are in charge of the schedule, which is frankly, I can't even conceive of, you know, and everyone is responsible for each other's safety and the whole, everyone kind of, it's corny, but you really do genuinely have to work together to make this thing exist. Mm -hmm. um, so everyone is really at the top of their game in every department, which is also like just an incredible thing to be a part of, um, that you can't help but sort of support each other because otherwise it does not work. And as an audience member and seeing the show and seeing you in the show, you were fabulous, but the, it was real and it really made people experience, be part of the show. Like you felt like you were in it, you were in that story. Yeah. So well done to you and everyone involved. Um, we're going to take a short break now and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Creatives on the Couch. Zach Rose, Gemma Cosgriff. And we're here with my delightful cousin, Gillian Cosgriff. <laughs> Welcome back. Thanks. Um, well, uh, you were recently in Auntie Donna's Coffee Cafe as a real estate agent. <laughs> I was, yes. Tell us about that. Uh, it was kind of wild. I, um, I am very good friends with uh, Michelle Brazier, who does a lot of stuff with Auntie Donna. And Paul Braze was in like a minor plane crash and got stuck in America and was meant to be back filming this role and could not, could not get back in time. All of the like drama, drama. Um, so the Donners called me and they were like, will you come and be a real estate agent? And I was like, will I? Um, it was great. I loved the original real estate agent sketch. Um, I had thankfully bought a house the year before, so I was like, I can offend all of these people. It's not going to be a drama for me. <laughs> I'm not going to be rocking up to inspections and then being like, we know who you are. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was an incredible experience. It was great. I love those boys. I've known them for a long time. Um, we sort of came up doing comedy together. Um... So yeah, it was it was just a, a wonderful thing to like be on set with them and Pia Miranda from Looking for Alan Brandy, yes. my yes. teenage dreams come to life. <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was incredible. They I think they're so funny and I think they make really interesting um, and just chaotic work, mm -hmm. um, which is really fun in a way that you know nobody else in Australia. Or, I mean, who else is doing it like the Donners are doing it? I don't know that anybody is. No, so it was a joy. Not. Tell us about what the show is about and how it's come to life as an idea. Auntie Donna's Coffee Cafe? Mm. Oh God, I don't know if I'm equipped to do that, <laughs> to be honest. Um, how about, tell us about your role in Auntie Donna's Cafe in terms of the part, how it fits in with the story and, and what the show is about. Oh sure, I mean the show is, is loosely that the boys um, run a coffee cafe together now. Um, it is... I would say that no episode ever goes in a direction that you think it's going to go in, which is really fun. Um, there's an episode where um, Richard Rocks replays his character from Rake <laughs> in, within the world of Auntie Donna. Um, it has some like, incredible cameos. So many of, of, I think, the funniest and loveliest people um, working in Australian comedy are, are in the show. Michelle Frazier, obviously. Um, Patrick Jones Silver from Hot Department. Frankie McNair. There's just... So many beautiful people involved in the show, just all bringing their kind of um, wildest ideas and characters to the set. And so 
it, it, you just is not a show where you can ever imagine where an episode is going to end from the start of the episode. But I like that. It's nice to be surprised. Sounds like a lot of fun. Now, in 2015, you had a show called Jillian Cosgriff is Whelmed. <laughs> what whelms you? <laughs> God, this is a way back. I can't even, I can barely remember what was in that show. <laughs> what did I have in that show? I mean, what whhelms me? What whhelms me? Um, what is being whelmed? I can't even remember that. <laughs> I was just so impressed with your assessment of the word and, cre- you know, creating this idea that you can be overwhelmed or underwhelmed, but can you just be whelmed? Yes. Whelmed. Where did that come from? Well, it is a line from 10 Things I Hate About You, the film. Oh. <laughs> but I, um, do you know, there's a thing that happens in comedy, which is that when you submit your show to a festival, it is generally six months before the festival, if not longer, and you have not written the show yet. <laughs> so you are trying to come up with a title and an image that you're like, and whatever jokes I think of will fit <laughs> with that. Um, so that was certainly the impetus initially. I remember that I found out that whelmed is a real word. It's like a sailing term. It's something to do with like when the water comes up to the gunnels. I can't remember it comes over. Anyway, all of this to say that whelmed is like, oh, um, I don't know. <laughs> It's it looks like the size of a boat. Yeah, I was like, yeah, this. I think it's also spelt gunwales, and I remember someone afterwards, I think that's how I was pronouncing it initially, being like, it's actually gunwales. And I was like, okay, I didn't mean to upset the maritime community with my misinformation. I genuinely cannot remember. It's a weird thing about making a solo show is also that you, you know, you craft this hour that is completely in your brain at any time, but then the next year you go, all right, Drawing board, start again, new hour, what are you going to do? Um, so it's a really bizarre thing. There are still bits and pieces of that show that I use, little bits of stand-up or mm. like the occasional song, but yeah, mostly you go, okay, bye, next. Of course, <laughs> That's the yeah. Thing. yeah. Now your most recent show, Actually Good, <laughs> yes. as opposed to Actually Good. Yes. It's got to come up. It does. Uh, have you won two awards at the 2023 Melbourne International Comedy Festival? The Golden Gibbo and The Most Outstanding Show. Now, this, from my understanding, is the second time in history that that this has happened where one person, one artist, has actually won both awards. How do you... Congratulations. Thank you. (laughs) How do you feel about that? I I mean, and and talk us through the show. What was it about and how did you come up with that, those ideas and and bring it all to life? Yeah, um, I, I... It is still unfathomable to me that this festival run went the way that it did it was and just a dream I um I, ha- I haven't done a comedy festival show since uh 2018 so where I've been five years out of the sh- out of the kind of circuit and so I was like I'll just I'll just make a little show I'll just sneak back in I'll just discreetly like do it if it goes fine if I make a bit of money fine but I just want to like go back to doing a one hour and it turns out that kind of nonchalance is what you need for success, I guess. <laughs> um, you just have to care as little as possible. Um, I really loved making this show. I am. Um, it basically starts with a, me talking about a game that my partner and I invented on a terrible holiday, where we asked each other for a list of ten things that you like. It's a countdown from ten to one. Ten is something that you just like. If you liked it any less, it wouldn't be on the list. Everything is about 10% more until number one is something that you love. And so in this show, I do that with the audience. So the door is open from the start to just be having a chat to go, hello, I'm here. I'm going to talk to you in this room. What do you like? And it's been a really beautiful experience. I didn't know if I would have to um, really ask people to go, hey, I need a number nine. It's going to be you. And I I didn't want to do that because it, it was so much nicer to me that people would be able to just volunteer as they felt comfortable and it was an amazing experience that people did. Like, it's such a simple question and there are genuinely no wrong answers. Um, and it means that the show is different every night and I write that list down in a big book. So I have this beautiful big book full of, like, all these lists of just, like, simple things that people like. Like, seeing a cow run. Um, or, like, somebody said uh, being able to get a USB in on the first go. You know, like, they're just, like, beautiful, really simple joys. It's been such a lovely experience. It also means that people, like write to me occasionally and will be like hey I just wanted to let you know like today I got a rock star park and I thought of you because I was like that's a five you know like <laughs> it's created this really nice kind of um community around it and like a language to use and that's been probably the most beautiful part of it um more than anything else everything else is obviously very nice awards are very nice um 
But that's kind of the nicest part of the whole experience is just genuinely being like, hey, I'm just going to think about small things that are good in the world and if you would also like to do that, let's do it together. It's really lovely. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about your shows, uh, the shows that I've been to as well, where you do you connect with the audience and people really like that in a, a literal sense. So they're able to contribute to your show, which is an art in itself, uh, and being able to bring that into your comedy and how you sing and the music that you write in the moment, which is um, an incredible uh, amount of talent. But also, you know, you explored some really... Um, deep and serious topics as well through this show. Uh, how did you find that? Do you, do you have to manage the way that you interact with the audience, the way that you tell that story? Um, and it's, it was obviously very meaningful to you. So, you know, and is it, is it a tribute? And how, like, how do you kind of set yourself up for that? Yeah, I think you do, you have a responsibility as an artist about how you're going to make people feel through this hour and after this hour. Um, and I felt very much the, um, not the weight, but the sort of the gift of just being like, okay, I'm in charge of how this is shaped and how you feel and how I navigate that. And it was very tricky to put it together and there were points where I was being too careful. Um, uh, I talk about um, a friend of mine who passed away and so my, um, my partner, Matt, is the most helpful sounding board to me in this whole process. So just being able to go, and he sees it from the very beginning where I just go, okay, on Friday, I'm just going to talk at you for an hour. And that first hour is just me pulling pieces of paper off the wall going, gingerbread house, negative gearing, is that a joke? It's just, <laughs> I'm just literally like, this bit's about straws. Anything? No, nothing? Okay, good. And I record that and then I kind of siphon through for what's good and then I rewrite that and I do a lot of improvising um, initially. And so kind of from generating all of that content, I go, okay, that should go here and this should thread there carefully. And I spent a lot of the pandemic particularly um, watching and listening to comedy that I think is beautifully structured. So um, Daniel Kitson, James Acaster, um, I had the absolute privilege of directing Michelle Brazier's show Average Bear a couple of years ago and I think she's a real master of that kind of beautiful storytelling, sentences that are beautifully written in comedy, which was really nice. I really, like, wrote this show in a way that I don't usually feel like I'm writing. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time I just feel like I'm, like, having a chat, which is nice. I love that. <laughs> but this is a show where I was able to be, like, you know, having a chat, but then also, like, having these, like, quite nicely crafted sentences that made me feel very proud of myself. Um, and so I really wanted to be able to kind of feel that thread and to kind of tie things together. And in the most perfect illustration of how much we don't know what our own work is, I did the very first show on the Monday night and I came home and I sat down at my kitchen table and I just cried. Mm -hmm. And I looked at my partner and I was like, well, I was like, you know, it's fine. And I, and I tried to make this thing and I guess I haven't done it, but I'll learn for next time. <laughs> and I made myself take a photo of myself crying because I was oh, like, no. I think you might feel a bit silly about this later. And little did I know how silly I would feel by the end of <laughs> truly a dream run of a show that really like came together from night two onwards. Um, yeah, but yeah, it, it was just an amazing experience. I'm so happy to be back in the festival world. I really love it. In the past, you've described yourself as a pessimist. Do you still see yourself as that now? No, the show is very much about like realising I'm a secret optimist, which I did not know. I think part of it's like, if you have any kind of creative endeavour that you work in, um, two things. Firstly, it's very easy for that to become your like personality, to go, I am my work. And that the pandemic, I think, was a really big challenge in being like, well, your work is gone, so who are you now? Um, yeah, too real, sorry. <laughs> There's tissues somewhere. Um, and, um, and then the, the other thing, uh, where is the other thing? Where did it go? Come back. What did you ask me? I know where I am. Ask you about I'm being a pessimist. Oh, a pessimist, yes. Is that um, because so much of this industry is out of your control a lot of the time, particularly if you're like an actor, if you're someone that doesn't necessarily make your own work, you are always relying on someone else to give you a job and to say, yes, you're good enough. We choose you. You're perfect for this. Is that I think you do a lot of preemptive um, pessimism or I guess realism to go, you go in for an audition and then your job is to go, I did the audition and I'm going to forget about that. I can't invest in going, if I get this job, then I'll have this, then I'll do this, because you might not get it. That's true. Or if the show goes brilliantly, then I'll have this. You can't count any chickens. Even some of the ones that have hatched might run away from you in this <laughs> job. So I think that's why I thought I was a pessimist, because 
you know, I would get a great opportunity and someone would go, hey, we'd really love to have you for this. And until it's signed, sealed, delivered, I would always kind of be like, well, that'll be nice if it happens. You know, that'll be really good if that works out. But it might not work out. So just cool. calm your jets, you know. And so, yeah, it was nice that with this kind of 10 likes list, a friend of mine was like, I don't, do you think you're a pessimist? She's like, I would never think of you like this. And I was like, oh, okay. So it has sort of like reframed my entire life in many ways too, just quietly, just to decide. We'll be back after a short break. Gillian, how do we all keep in touch and across what you're doing and where you're at and when we can come and see you and your performances or your work? Yeah, I'm uh, at Gillian Cosgriff, Gillian with a G. Um, Cos, like the lettuce, Griff, like a griffin. Is this how you say it? <laughs> I don't know. Use this <laughs> Honestly, I think it confuses people more. Um, at Gillian Cosgriff on all my socials. Um, my website is gilliancosgriff.com. I'm touring my show, Actually Good, um, around Australia and possibly the world. Watch this space. So um, all of those tour dates are kind of to be announced. But if you look at me on the internet, I will be yelling about it. <laughs> Magnificent. We will be following. Great. Thank you so much for your time, Gillian. It's been an absolute delight hearing about your work and your creativity and how you bring your art to all of us, and, and we really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This is Creatives on the Couch. I'm Gemma Cosgrove, and this is Zach Rose. See you next time.